Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing the impact and need to advance gender and ethnic diversity in the field of STEM with special guests, Meredith Gibson, CEO of the Association for Women in Science in Washington, D.C., Dr. Shirley Malcolm, board chair of the National Math and Science Initiative and director of Sea Change at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, also in Washington, D.C., Dr. Allison Scott, CEO of the KPOR Center Foundation in Oakland, California, and uh, Elena Percival, CEO and board chair of Women Who Code in San Francisco, California. So thank you all for joining us. I'm so excited to be here on this uh, Pay Equity Day, uh, as, as Meredith uh, prompted uh, me to remember. And we just had another, another um, uh, conversation with, with another panel on exactly that topic, Pay Equity uh, for Women. But uh, let's, let's uh, kick this off and just uh, sort of point out this astounding statistic that today's STEM work, workforce is roughly 89% white and 72% male, according to the National Science Foundation uh, data. So why is this? Let's, let's sort of have a real discussion as to why we're having such a skewed workforce. It seems so insane when we're trying to take advantage of every single scrap of talent we have in this country. Uh, Meredith, could you give us your take on the state of affairs in STEM and the state of equity in STEM? Thank you so much. I just want to start by saying thanks for having this important discussion today and inviting me in to join this panel and talk about it. At the Association for Women in Science, we believe women should have the opportunity to fulfill their full potential as scientists, as problem solvers, and innovators. And you're right to point out this statistic. There are a number of factors, certainly, that play into this low percentage for women and people of color in the workforce. One of the factors, of course, is depending on the field, lack of graduates in specific fields from higher education. The National Center for Education Statistics reported in 2015 that the percentage of women in color attending higher education institutions who earned STEM degrees were 2.9% for Black women, 3.8% for Latinas and Latinx, and 5% for Asian women. So first, you've got a problem of people coming into the field generally, whether they... It's that whole pipeline, right? There's the whole pipeline. But then you have the second area of the problem that AWIS works on a lot, which is that Scientific American reported 45% of women leave STEM jobs because they feel underpaid and underrepresented. So there are two portions to the problem, not a lot of people in, and then a lot of people leaving quickly. So this discrimination and bias create these workplaces that are not um, welcoming, they don't feel inclusive, and people aren't staying, women specifically aren't staying in, this, in these fields, and we're losing their talent and their expertise. You know, there's another there's another issue which connects to that, and that is the whole idea of uh, we we've heard it talk uh, we've heard people talk about sponsorship and mentoring and all all that stuff, but there's there's something really subtle that goes on, and I've seen it ha unfold in my own career, in which um, people in a, in authority who are very often men are looking at leaderly qualities that seem to model their own attitudes, their own behaviors, and so. They, they make reference to factors for promotion, which has absolutely nothing to do with talent, the ability to deliver. Dr. Malcolm, it, it, when you look at that kind of behavior, it creates a sort of systemic disadvantage of anybody who doesn't look like the person who is making the decisions, right? Right. I mean, the, it's the, and thanks for having this conversation. Uh, it have, I don't know. Sometimes people use code words. Uh, they will talk about, well, that person isn't a good fit. Or charisma, right? right? Charisma. Or they just are too, or well, in many cases, they will say uh, that the women seem a bit abrasive or <laughs> aggressive. Now, in the guy coming there, they will say he's a go-getter. But they, even the language is different. You know, there is the kind of like what thing that they want to tag you with. And they tag you with the negative things um, and they stick this they stick this tag on you. And then there you are. 
you don't have a chance from the beginning because uh, they, they expect not to see you and uh, they ask that you be even more competent and capable than the people that you that might otherwise be considered. Well, you know, it's it, it's really uh, interesting. You know, I, when I think of the Cape Wars, you know, uh, Mitch and Frida, um, you're talking about uh, real equals and and people with their own opinions and people with their own uh, personalities, uh, Dr. Scott, right? I mean, you've got there a model of people who um, have found their their way to mutual respect and, and equality. How do you see it in the Cape Horse Center in terms of trying to take the ideas of your founders and the lives of your founders and, and invest that in your own programs? Um, as you mentioned, the Cape Horse Center um, has was started by Mitch Kapor and Frida Kapor Klein, um, both of whom are titans in the field of uh, tech and d- racial um, and gender diversity. So um, our foundation focuses on the intersection of racial justice and technology. Um, all of the things that we do are under the mission of um, attempting to create a more equitable technology ecosystem that addresses racial inequality, that creates economic opportunity, and that reflects the power and perspectives of diverse communities. Um, So we have a very deep interest in, um, similar to what Meredith said, in looking at the entire ecosystem. Um, So there are a variety of challenges and barriers that we see across the entire um, tech ecosystem. We work a lot around K-12 computer science education, which I hope we'll dive more into today. Um, In California, only 30% of the students taking computer science are girls and Black, Latinx, and Indigenous girls are even more underrepresented. Um, But we're also concerned with looking at... um, who's in the technical workforce, who's in the overall tech workforce, um, C-suite leadership, um, board of directors, um, who are entrepreneurs starting companies, who are, who's getting investment to start um, creating new technology products, um, and who are the investors that are deploying the resources. So it's a multi-pronged issue. We're looking at um, all of the um, different uh, areas across the pipeline, and um, there's a lot of work to be done. Well, and and I think that that uh, Dr. Malcolm's point about uh, some of the um, attitudinal elements and also the language. I love your point, um, uh, Dr. Malcolm, about the the language here, um, uh, the 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 subtleties, because the subtleties are so pervasive, and it it creates this this kind of um, assumptive uh, conclusion that leads in a particular direction that that already tilts the table uh, from the very beginning. Um, Elena Percival, um, women who code, right? Women who code, women who code, right? That in, its, in itself, in that language, you're actually making a statement, aren't you? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, so I'm uh, uh, Elena Percival, uh, CEO and co-founder of Women Who Code, and I am honored, um, Mark, to be among these thought leaders in this room. So um, thank you for having me here and Women Who Code represented, and um, uh, a special thank you to everyone who's tuning in for this uh, very important conversation. One of the things that uh, I wanted to add um, is... What we often see is once once you're in the tech industry, um, it's uh, our our members, our community. They get what I call encouraged out of their career paths. And so, when you do demonstrate what would be leadership skills for their male counterparts, they say, "Oh, you know, have you thought about recruiting? Because you work so well in um, getting people to join the team, or you're so great at at." Uh, talking to people about, um, about the product. Um, have you thought about product management or marketing or project management? And what they really should be saying is we should be considering you to lead this, this team. We should be considering you to lead this project. And that never happens for, for their male counterparts. And what it represents for each woman who then gets diverted from from their chosen career path is a uh, one point seven million dollars in lifetime earnings. So if you stay on that career path versus go into another fantastic but outside of um, the technology career path, it represents one point seven million dollars for diverse women and their families. 
And and we also need to remind ourselves, and I'm going to switch over to, to first names just because it's easier if it's, if it's okay with everyone. Um, we, we need to remind ourselves that that $1.7 million is the individual income, but the value to society is, is, is a multiple of, of that. So what we're actually doing is we're depriving America, we're depriving our civil society, we're depriving our businesses, we're depriving our country of, of the useful talents that we have. We just um, are finishing a uh, poll in which we say, how urgent is it to make changes in order to diversify the STEM workforce? And we, 80%, a good 80% of the people say it's, it's a real emergency. We really need to, to deal with this. Uh, 20% said, you know, change will occur over, over time. It's, it, it's, it's of concern, but it's not, it's not a big topic. Uh, nobody said it's not, it, it's not urgent. So, um, Meredith, how do you see this? If, if, if we're talking about all the different problems that we have in society and there is a disparity that exists, particularly in STEM, how important is it to the country that we change this and we engage more people? We deal with the pipeline issue that, that Shirley mentioned, the disparities that Allison mentioned, the, uh, the issues that uh, Elena mentioned. How much of an emergency is it for the United States of America? Um, as we've all just lived through the COVID, COVID pandemic, and as we have benefited from the science and what we've learned, I mean, the day I learned that I could sit with my friends on a porch outside, that was a huge day. I could see people again. I, so, And then knowing the vaccines came and the distribution that came from that, moving away from even the economic impact, the fact that we lose so many talented people, Women, absolutely, but men leave the field too. And knowing that our society with climate change and pandemics and the other things we face are, um, are significant problems, I don't, I, it's hard for me to come to a conclusion that it is not an emergency and that it doesn't deserve the focus. Can we assume, uh, uh, please, Shirley. Uh, l- let me add another, uh, another element to this. Uh, and that is that we know that diverse teams actually do create better products. You, you, are de- you are depriving yourself, as it were, of excellence. You are depriving yourself of, a, of responsive, uh, responsive technology. And there are lots of examples that have basically cropped up during the pa- pandemic. Uh, for example, the termination that pulse oximeters were uh, under measuring the uh, oxy- uh, they were over measuring the blood oxygen levels of people of color and that essentially you were sending people home who should have remained in the hospital because their arterial blood and the blood that was taken from pulse oximeters that somebody created and didn't look at whether the impact of color on being able to get a good reading, that in fact that it was having this kind of negative effect. Now, uh, there are other examples. Uh, we know that companies that do companies do better that have diverse teams that are doing this work that have diverse boards, and yet you are seeing discrimination. For example, around startups where uh, that women. Uh, are involved in. You're not seeing them engaged as like scientific advisors. You're not seeing them on boards. And when they go for a pitch, to make a pitch for a venture, that in many cases you're seeing them say, well, maybe you should have your male postdoc make this presentation because you they will in fact be discriminated against. And the, the point is, it's the entire ecosystem that is the problem. From the beginning, when you have the opportunity to take courses that will that will take you into these uh, uh, opportunities all the way through the institutions that you are part of where you may major until you leave because of weed out courses or the way that you experience that environment all the way through to the actual business side of things. So I think you've got to think about this systemically, which is what we do at AAAS through our work in sea change, but the, the, with regard to colleges and universities. But this pervades the, the, the enterprise. And I think that we've got to start looking at it as a systemic challenge. 
one of the things that really strikes me as being somebody who can do a little bit of math, right? When you have 89% of the STEM workforce being white, that means that we're only tapping into one-tenth of the potential of non-white STEM talent. It's the same thing with with women, right? It's a little bit better. Uh, you know, uh, 72% are, 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 are male across uh, across the board. We're we're suboptimizing. I mean, should should we be suboptimizing, uh, Allison? It's how, kind how of a you, dumb you, move. It, it, it it's it's really <laughs> stupid, right? It's really stupid. Um, it do, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. I don't care if you're a conservative or ultra ultra conservative, ultra liberal. We're we're, we're trying not to be stupid, right? Right. Um, Allison, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about some of those programs that you were talking about. And Elena, I'd like to also talk about your programs to try and systematically uh, push back this, this pipeline issue. Um, and uh, Allison, why don't you give it, a, give it a first shot and then we'll, we'll move over to Elena. Yeah, I think, um, and just wanted to double down on uh, what Dr. Malcolm said. I think um, framing this as, you know, we all are excited um, about the potential and the promise of technology and have been for for decades, right? And so if we think about how um, we are missing out on all of these uh, incredibly talented individuals, um, we're missing out on new ideas, we're missing out on new ways of thinking about products, we're missing out on um, ways that products can be deployed. Um, and so we think about what we're losing on the one hand. And then another way that we also like to think about it is what is, what is the harm of exclusion? And I, I heard it mentioned earlier, and the harm of exclusion is economic mobility and opportunity as we're seeing widening inequality across uh, race and gender. Um, other harms are things like um, Dr. Malcolm said, which is actual harms on people's everyday lives because women and people of color aren't at the table in creating products or deploying products. And so we see this play out in things like algorithmic bias and impacts on the criminal justice system and impacts on employment and hiring. Um, so there are a variety of reasons why we have to address this problem. And just, just very briefly, I can talk about two um, of our priority topics at the K4 Center. Um, one is um, working at a systems level to increase access and equity in computer science education. We know that computer science education is essential for all young people, um, but we have to make a concerted effort that to ensure that uh, young women and uh, people of color are included and have access to courses um, throughout their K-12 education. So that's something that we're very passionate about. Um, and then the second piece is through our partners at K-4 Capital um, that op um, operate a seed stage um, investment firm is how do you get more investors to invest in diverse entrepreneurs, deploy capital to new ideas? Um, we have about 130 um, startups at this point um, that are working on a whole variety of solutions um, you can go to k4capital.org to check out some of the companies, but some of them are addressing things like Meredith mentioned, climate change, um, working at fintech. Um, all of them are closing gaps of access and opportunity um, for the most marginalized communities. So your, your approach is to basically take different segments of this value chain that, uh, that uh, Meredith was w w uh, pointed out in her example that can lead to uh, uh, scientific research that can affect things like the pandemic and start to uh, systematically uh, deal with that from the very earliest stages all the way through to the investment and seed capital elements. Uh, Elena, what is your cut on creating that experience for uh, young people, uh, people who are entering into a career, people who are in career, uh, to create that sort of mentorship and, and opportunity and sense of self to make that that uh, contribution. Yeah. So while all pieces of the pipeline are incredibly important, I know that the fastest and easiest way to create greater equity in the tech industry is by keeping the diverse talent and helping that diverse talent succeed in the tech industry today. And so that means um, in, in investing in, elevating, creating a sense of belonging, um, 
designing for inclusion inside of organizations, not, not just leaving it on the individuals to overcome the bias that exists, but actually um, working with the industry to continuously design for inclusion, examine practices, take imperfect steps forward um, to create greater inclusion. And what we need to see is um, the incredible talent that's in the industry continuing to find ways to step up, to move forward, and to also highlight uh, the talent in the industry because um, young people, they they don't see themselves reflected in technology leadership. And I can tell you they are there. And that's one of the things that, that we do is we work to highlight um, role models in the tech industry, people who you know, have patents, have um, built companies, are leading technology teams, are um, leading security teams because they are there. They are um, creating and changing the world through technology. And um, so supporting supporting the women there, working with the industry to really uh, design for inclusion and then highlighting and supporting uh, the people who are who are in leadership positions so that they can be role models, but also so that they can continue to thrive. We just asked a poll um, in, in a poll, what is the most important change that needs to happen for uh, so that more uh, women and people of color hold leadership positions in STEM? Three, three areas got votes, better K through 12 and higher ed, uh, that, that particularly targets uh, uh, women and people of color. Uh, companies hiring more diverse uh, leaders and, and ensuring that promotions are equitable and improve pay and opportunities where disparities exist. There were a whole bunch of other options, but it really is very practical. It's, it's educating people, um, hiring, and and pay. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, since... I am I am um, really gifted by your presence and your wisdom and your lived experience, which is different from mine. I'm a white guy of a certain age, have had a, a career uh, trajectory that includes uh, tech and and STEM fields and and so on. And I recruit people. So tell me what I should do. Tell me what my clients should do. Um, to and, and we're going to start with uh, with Dr. Shirley Malcolm, and then we'll go to Elena, um, and then Meredith, and then uh, uh, Dr. Scott. But um, Shirley, if you're sitting in my office and you're looking me square in the eye and you're saying you're a recruiter, Mark, you need to do this. You need to help your clients do this. What what is this? What can I do to change things to be? part of a solution that will help make people's lives better, but also America stronger? Uh, I think that you begin by investing in the talent pool. You will begin to understand a lot better where your opportunities are if you uh, invest early and continue to invest and make a, an inclusive vision, a kind of a criterion for where you invest. And I, I give you an example uh, I, I chair NIMSI, the National Math Science Initiative, and that 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 starts at the beginning of the pool. You know, this notion of have, giving people access to advanced placement, to other kinds of courses where people can gain the skills. But the next issue of within uh, universities, invest in the institutions that are actually producing the people that you want. So the question is, are you putting money into HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities? Are you putting money into tribal colleges or into Hispanic serving institutions? Are you putting the money in the places where you're likely to, that they're stimulating the talent? And as you you invest, you begin to uh, become this kind of beacon. People see you as investing in things that, in fact, they want to be a part of. And then invest in your own workforce and in the leadership development opportunities within your own workforce. Bring this talent up. Don't just basically sit people on the bench. So you're, you're, you're saying, uh, one of the things that you're saying is that instead of just investing in my alma mater, I should be querying my alma mater as to whether they're creating the pipeline of graduates that we need in this country, that that where uh, where we can address these types of issues, 
and then going to alternative uh, investments who are actually doing it, right? Yes. <laughs> and, and placing that on a level playing field. So we're buying the country we want. We're buying the civil society yes. that we want. That's You're supporting the talent development institutions. And if they're not supporting talent development, why are you investing in them? Elena, um, what what is your recommendation? You know, modeling my behavior as as a recruiter, as someone who works with boards that are making these decisions. Um, what is your suggestion? Yeah, so um, it's similar. Uh, invest in the the communities that are are doing the work, whether it's institutions or organizations like Women Who Code or the KPOR Center. Um, but make sure that you're sharing your best technical jobs uh, with diverse communities, with um, w- with women, with historically excluded communities. Women Who Code has 300,000 technologists in our organization. If you say that you've posted your job to LinkedIn and you haven't had any women, any people of color apply, um, but you haven't posted your job to Women Who Code, uh, you're, you're not uh, taking the small steps even. That's not even the hard things. But again, investing in in your company, making sure that if once you've solved the pipeline, if everyone stops when you ask a, a question about a game, I had a debate with a CTO once who asked about uh, a game as part of their um, in interview process. And they said, oh, well, it's an easy game. But I turned to a woman next to me and she's like, well, I've never played the game before. You're asking her to not only go through a stressful interview set uh, session, but also to try to understand uh, what the question is that you're even asking. So look for where the breakpoints happen and continue looking because you will fix something, you'll break something else and you have to find another way to fix that. You know, I can't sufficiently endorse your, your point, right? The whole interview process is flawed. When you look at results, there's no gender, there's no race. When you start to interview based on preconceptions, like it's, you know, see how somebody does in a particular game, then you start to talk about culture and and gender roles and so on, and you've automatically tilted everything. So part of this is about going to where the talent is actually accomplishing something, Mm -hmm. right? Where you see signs of, uh, of an ability to generate results as opposed to making reference on your own terminology of charisma or pedigree or or a particular um, uh, methodology, results are results, uh, right? Right, Allison? How, how, how do you advise me in terms of my conversations with others, in terms of my own behavior and my own hiring? Yeah, I would just echo um, exactly what Dr. Malcolm and, and Elena also said. Um, I think three things. One, um, I think we have to do away, or we have to A, acknowledge and B, address um, the very real closed networks um, and assumptions about quality of talent that are playing out in how we recruit and hire. So um, study after study after study is showing that tech companies are going to the same, either top 10 universities, or if they're in a specific region, they're going to you know the, the flagship institution as opposed to literally just going down the street to a state college, HBCU, tribal college, HSIs that have a plethora of, of diverse talent. Um, so we have to figure out that that piece of it because that's literally gatekeeping who has access to um, to entry into the company. I also want to double down on the the point about culture. So if you're building an inclusive, a diverse and inclusive culture, um, and that becomes um, something that others are aware of and that folks are, are sharing more broadly. You know, talent have choices. And I think we've seen that in the um, during this this uh, period of what, what people are calling the great resignation. Um, so you want to be a company that has a great reputation for um, inclusion as it relates to gender and, and racial diversity. And then lastly, um, you mentioned, um, how, you know, interacting with boards. And I think um, something that we really have to consider is, um, accountability metrics. And so like, are we going to set, are we going to say this is a nice to have, or are we going to set it as a goal and hold ourselves accountable and measure it in the same way that we would measure something like our, um, our returns or our sales. Um, and so I think that's, um, those would be my recommendations. Thank you so much, Allison and Meredith, we're going to give you, you've been so patient. We're going to give you the last word 
Tell us what to do. Tell me what to do. Tell me how today can unfold so that my behaviors are, are making a contribution to, 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 to this country. Well, I agree with everything that has been said here so far. So that's all good information to have. One, uh, two other things that I would think about. Once you've made the commitment and you've had diverse hires, you need to know that your internal systems are going to need to change. And that's sometimes hard for people or board members to remember. They think I've done the hard work. I have a diverse starting well, point. So you're not, done, you're not done at the point of hiring, right? You're not done at the point of hiring. You've got to continue to refine your internal processes to support the people that you've brought in. There's a broken rung. Women and people of color don't get promoted to the next step and to the manager step anywhere near as frequently as white men do. So you really need to address that. Um, so that's what I would think about and have a board member think about. Systemic change is hard. It's sometimes even hard to think about. Veranda Montgomery uses an analogy that it's like a house plant. If there's a house plant with the yellow leaf, you think, oh, do I need more water or less water, more sun or less sun? If you've got staff members who aren't progressing in their career, what is the systemic change that you can make in the same way you would help a plant? You can help your employees achieve their full potential. You know, that's such an important point. In, in our own practices, we take reference to whether uh, something is interfering with outcomes. And if it doesn't, we set it aside. We've had people who've had to uh, leave the country. Um, we've had people who've had to take leave uh, or move to part-time for caregiving uh, roles. We've had people who've had to shift their hours in different ways. And we only ask one question, can we achieve results? And how do we achieve results by making a change in ourselves? And if the answer is there's a cha change we can make, we make it because we don't want to lose the talent. Talent is so incredibly precious. And I'd like to thank you all for, in, in this short period of time, give us giving us so much eva uh, valuable uh, advice Meredith Gibson, CEO of the Association for Women in Science in Washington, D.C., Dr. Shirley Malcolm, board chair of the National Math and Science Initiative and director of Sea Change at the American Association for the Advancement of Science in Washington, D.C., Dr. Allison Scott, the CEO of the Caper Center Foundation in Oakland, and Elena Percival, CEO and board chair of Women Who Code in San Francisco. This has just been phenomenal. I'd like to just thank you all and your staff and your board and your colleagues and your funders. This is so incredibly valuable. It's so appreciated that, that, you, uh, that you took some time today. On Thursday, we're going to talk about natural history, a related topic, right? The whole idea of what is the value of science uh, in society and, and museums that study uh, science. So thank you all and everyone stay safe and uh, we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you. Have thank a great you, day. Take care.